Welcome everybody, I'm Sunil Amrith, um, Interim Director of the Mahindra Humanities Centre at Harvard um, for another installation of our series of conversations on COVID-19. I'm really pleased today to have with me Professor Michael Wilrich, who's left Families Professor of History at Brandeis uh, and author of Pox, an American History, which was published um, back in 2011 and which is, seems more timely than ever today. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I wonder if you could start by telling us a little bit about the smallpox epidemic that swept through the United States at the very beginning of the 20th century and the, and the course that that epidemic took. Uh, sure. It was a uh, kind of a wave of epidemics, really, that, that crested across the United States between 1898 and 1903, um, ultimately affecting every state in the union and most most local communities uh, from the south up to Alaska. And, and also there were outbreaks in the uh, US uh, colonial holdings, um, possessions in the Philippines and in Puerto Rico. So it's really uh, kind of the full uh, picture of, of, the, of the United States during this period. Um, and it was a, a really complicated set of epidemics because um, some of them were of classic smallpox, very severe, killing you know 25 percent of the people they infected. The kinds of horror, horrifying experiences that were known to uh, world history, uh, and some of them, many of them, in fact, were epidemics of um, a new strain of the virus. Uh, that has since been called uh, variola minor to, to distinguish it from the classic uh, variola major. Um, and in this case, the, the uh, case fatality rates in local communities could be you know, about 2%, you know, close to what we're, we're seeing with COVID-19, uh, or even as low as 1%. And so there was a lot of sort of uh, uh, conflict over the diet, you know, how to diagnose these outbreaks and, um, and, and this also uh, was one of the contributing factors to all of the uh, dissension uh, around uh, public health during these epidemics. Thank you. Um, I mean, key argument in the book, of course, is that this was a pivotal moment in the history of public health in the US, mm -hmm. especially in terms of compulsory vaccination. Um, mm -hmm. So what were the major legal and legislative shifts that took place around this epidemic, uh, which with, with legacies that, of course, continue to this day? Yeah, so, I mean, um, the power of local governments and state governments as well to respond to epidemics um, is part of what's known broadly as the police power, the power to regulate or interfere with individual liberty or property rights in the name of the general welfare. And the public health has always been the strongest case for this kind of power. Um, so quarantines, um, setting up isolation hospitals and, and, and taking people there against their will, um, the power to vaccinate people, uh, whether they want to be vaccinated or not. Um, a whole whole set of technologies sort of um, old and new put into um, service during these epidemics. Um, how did things change? Well, um, there was a massive litigation uh, that came from people first at the states and then uh, making their way up to the federal courts and the Supreme Court ultimately um, that challenged the, the right of uh, state and local governments to carry out compulsory vaccination, whether it was to uh, as a requirement for children to enter the public schools, or whether it was a requirement for anyone to leave their homes during an epidemic. Um, and ultimately, the Supreme Court uh, confirmed the uh, decisions of, of lower courts that these measures were perfectly constitutional. And the Supreme Court, uh, in an opinion that really drew on language from lower courts, likened these powers to the powers of governments to protect the people during a military invasion. And so they said that the individual has no more right to refuse this order than an individual does uh, the right have to right to refuse a, a conscription order. Um, and so there's a very strong um, endorsement 
of police power given by the Supreme Court, but also a series of, of kind of reservations and qualifications that come in the same decision from 1905, um, including a basic premise that, premise that these measures must be reasonable, that they must be a response to actual sort of necessitous circumstances, uh, and they must be carried out in a way um, that uh, really does the least harm uh, to individual uh, individual citizens. Um, one other piece of the of the legal legacy of these epidemics is hugely important: is the development of a system of licensing and, and regulation of vaccine production, which did not exist through uh, these years I'm talking about, um, and which was one of the reasons that the epidemics were in the public health response was such a contentious matter, because governments were ordering people to be vaccinated, ordering people to have their children vaccinated, but those same governments did nothing to ensure that the vaccines on the market were effective and safe. Uh, so the Biologics Control Act, which came out of these epidemics, uh, an act of Congress was also a hugely important legacy. There were others, but these are two of the, the main ones. One of the very powerful things you do in the is, is to tell this as a story also of, of inequality and, and domination, mm. particularly the ways in which immigrants and African communities were disproportionately targeted for, for police action. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it has certainly strong resonances today with what we're seeing. Um, uh, first of all, um, immigrants uh, and African Americans, members of the wor working class generally in American cities, but also in, in, in the rural South, uh, were, were most vulnerable to the disease of, of all the populations because of the, the way that they were living in very thickly populated areas, to the way that they uh, were largely uh, neglected by uh, the medical establishment during normal times. Um, and then when the, when the uh, outbreaks occurred, these same communities really were the first to be targeted for quarantine and compulsory vaccination. So you have scenes um, like on the um, uh, Upper East Side, East Harlem area of New York uh, in 1901, the, in the winter of, of vaccination squads, these teams of public health officers and Lancet bearing physicians uh, accompanied by police with billy clubs going into tenement neighborhoods, cordoning off blocks, entering the buildings in the middle of the night, knocking on doors, uh, inspecting the premises, uh, inspecting people's arms to see if they had the sign of, a, of a, the, the scar of a recent vaccination. If they didn't, ordering them to be vaccinated on the spot, sometimes carrying these out by force. Um, there were riots, there were people running, taking to the rooftops, the whole thing. And But the most poignant uh, moments in these episodes were the when public health officials had to or chose to or had to take children away, infected children away from their mother's arms and, and take them off to the Pest Hospital, which was in the middle of an island in the East River. Um, this was, these were scary scenes and they were unimaginable in other parts, other more affluent, whiter uh, areas of New York or other, other uh, communities. So race was a huge uh, and, and ideas about race were a huge animating factor uh, throughout these epidemics. So this is a story of vaccination, but also of, of quarantine. And, and there are very vivid descriptions in the book of these, of the pest houses. Mm. What were conditions like in the pest houses? What, how, how, how were they structured? What was the experience like to the, to the best of which? Yeah, so, um, I mean, these were, every community during an epidemic would throw together a pest house, usually by, in the smaller communities, by, um, by commandeering uh, a, uh, a house at the edge of town um, and uh, taking it over and then um, bringing patients, uh, bringing infected people from around the community into this place. And in big, in big urban centers like Boston and New York, these uh, pest houses would frequently be located in buildings on um, islands, uh, like North Brother Island in New York, or one of the islands in the harbor of, of, of Boston. Um, and then within them, there was very little that doctors could do to treat uh, smallpox, other than to try to treat people for 
a discomfort, uh, try to provide some, some sort of basic sense of care. Um, but these spaces were understood to be places where the poor were taken. Uh, and they were reviled among uh, uh, working class people in American communities. And they were reviled by, also by people, uh, so often working class people as well, um, in whose communities the, they would be placed, right, during an emergency. Um, so there are many episodes I, I found during my research of uh, neighborhoods uh, rising up when a, when a pest house had been put in their midst and in fact tearing it down or burning it down, setting it aflame, um, obviously you know, driving the people out first. But um, these were um, a very, uh, very controversial uh, institutions um, of, of a world kind of gone by. It reminds me a lot actually of the plague epidemic in India at precisely mm. the same moment in the 1890s yeah. where the plague hospitals were reviled and they were reviled not just because of the intrusiveness that they represented but also because they were places which quite reasonably poor people thought they would be sent to die because yeah. Not, not that many people returned from some of these institutions. Um, so, so there was a resonance there, which, which I certainly um, uh, was, was struck by. And, and people in them, you know, taken away from their families, right? And in a way, in many of these communities, I think in India probably as well, right? Um, the best chances that infected people had of survival was being cared for by family members who had, would, would be sort of constantly watching over them and taking care of them, so. Um, yeah. So another major theme of the book is, is, of course, the theme of resistance to vaccination. And you've already mentioned that briefly in terms of the litigation. Uh, but, but what forms did that resistance take? Yeah, so it took all kinds of forms. And this is a, became a, just a particular obsession for me was sort of tracking these out. But ranging from um, organized resistance of, of, of groups that formed anti-vaccination leagues, had their own literature, um, not wildly dissimilar from the anti-vaxxers today, um, but, uh, but from them, uh, there were also um, uh, groups of working, working people who formed organizations, very temporary organizations, to go down to uh, a town hall and, and, and demand that uh, compulsory vaccination be ceased. Um, there were also parents uh, who, with their children, staged school strikes. Uh, who would either withhold their students from the schools or take them down to local schools unvaccinated and demand that they uh, be um, allowed to, to matriculate, to take classes. Um, in uh, closer quarters or in, in, in environments where um, there's already a great deal of tension around uh, race or class, um, you see these sort of spontaneous riots occur. Um, when the vaccinators show up on the scene. Um, but some of my famous, fa favorite examples just involve sort of everyday subterfuge, like forging vaccination certificates. Uh, and and my, my favorite of all examples is the uh, forging of the vaccination scar. So vaccination <laughs> produced a distinctive uh, circuitric, circuitric, a sort of a nickel-sized uh, scar on the usually on the arm where the vaccine was carried out. Um, and uh, health authorities actually looked for this scar. Like they could recognize it, they could discern, you know, that how, how recently it had happened and so on. And so some folks uh, who wanted to um, pretend that they had been vaccinated or that their children had, would take a little bit of nitric acid, uh, very, quite diluted, and put it on the skin of this place, leave it on for about three or four minutes, then dab it off, and it would leave behind after a few days a scar uh, that looked very much like a recent smallpox scar. So people literally um, marking their bodies uh, as forgeries. Yeah. Fascinating. And in terms of the arguments they're using against vaccination, are these arguments about individual liberty? Are they about safety? How do those different factors come together? Well, so this is one of the things that really, I think, uh, distinguishes this period is because they had so many good arguments to make. So, um, yes, personal liberty, constitutional liberty, common law rights, uh, uh, you know, parental rights, masculine rights, all of this kind of rights discourse uh, was very much powerfully invoked during this period against what was a growing state. 
Um, but at the same time, there are arguments about uh, medical liberty, about thought, about ideas, about freedom of conscience, uh, which, which were quite uh, compelling to many uh, observers at the time in a period which um, the regimentation and regulation of medicine itself was, was occurring at a very rapid pace. Um, then there were the health concerns, which were um, really quite reasonable. Um, vaccine uh, was a, the product of a kind of combination of the stable and the laboratory. Vaccines were harvested from the underbellies of calves uh, taking vaccinia or um, what, what had previously been uh, cowpox back in the day, but in the early 20th century would have been vaccinia virus from the sores on, on cows and, and, and sort of sometimes providing some sort of uh, uh, glycerin or some uh, uh, additive in the laboratory that would um, stabilize it and remove some of the impurities. And then next thing you know, it's being scraped into the arms of little children. Well, um, many people had complications associated with this, ranging from the very typical sore arm and fever, which would put people out of work for several days in a time when there's no workers' comp, you know, no, no system for compensating laborers who lose their wages temporarily. Um, or in the worst cases that occurred, uh, uh, vaccines became um, contaminated with tetanus spores. And so there are uh, episodes such as occurred in Camden in 1901, where, where children died of, uh, of uh, post-vaccination -vac -vac tetanus um, that was traced to the tetanus itself. Um, so there are a host of arguments uh, uh, ranging from the libertarian to the very practical. So to turn to, to our current moment, and of course we're talking to each other from our, <laughs> from our yeah. houses on Zoom, to turn to the, the current pandemic. Governments, universities, all of us as citizens are putting a lot of hope that a vaccine against the coronavirus will, will be found in the not too distant future. Reading your book has sort of reinforced to me, of course, the sense that finding a vaccine is, is not the end of the story. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the vaccination in society in our, our moment. Yeah, I mean, whew, uh, I think most of us right now are pining for a, a good vaccine or really for many, many vaccines, right, that would be uh, effective, produced in different countries. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, they'll, they would need to be um, decisions made about um, how vaccination would be carried out, under what circumstances, where it would be required, where it would be voluntary. I mean, I think that initially that, that the, the general public would be running to this vaccine rather than away from it, uh, as was often the, the case uh, in the early 20th century. Um, but there, uh, in the past 15, 20 years, there's been a rising anti-vaccination movement. Um, and if uh, these uh, protests out in front of state houses are any, ind any indication, uh, we can expect that some of those folks will um, object to any measure to make, uh, make this uh, you know, COVID-19 vaccine compulsory. Um, and again, under our, under our laws in the United States, um, you know, much has changed in the 20th century and the early 21st century with the growth of the federal government, but these are still going to be state measures. Um, and so that we can expect that there will be wide variation among the states in terms of, of how they carry out vaccination, uh, just as there is uh, right now with regard to social distancing, or there's a sort of real conflict going on, as you know, between, among different states. Michael, thank you so very much for talking to us. This has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you. It's been my pleasure.